We're next going to switch to a conversation about agri-food innovation. And this is really about building bridges between Chicago and Champaign, as we both provide leadership to grow the food and ag industry in Illinois. We're both supporting entrepreneurs. We have established industry. And we're a location throughout Illinois that has a highly educated workforce and a location in the heart of the Midwest. So in Chicago, there's World Business Chicago. That's the economic development leadership of the city of Chicago. And they have a new interim president and CEO, Michael Fasenot. We're gonna learn more about what they're up to in WBC, but part of that is the work that they're doing at Chicago Next. So I was at a Chicago Next Council meeting, a proud participate, a participant in that group when we heard about the, the new leadership of the organization. And we've seen some of his work of how they're creatively selling the city of Chicago and attracting new companies. That's uh, his work as the former chief marketing officer of the city of Chicago, but also I'll say as somebody who worked first in advertising in the city of Chicago when I graduated from the University of Illinois, and important to have a good storyteller. And I think he's going to do that a little bit today as telling you why Chicago thinks uh, it's a great destination to grow this industry further. He is also going to be joined by a panel, and BJ Singh, a professor of ag engineering, will be introducing those panel participants. I'd like to just say a little bit of thank you to my friend, Samir, who will be part of that, who's the deputy mayor of the city of Chicago as well. Um, I think for those of us that work in deep tech, it's really great to see a deputy mayor of the city of Chicago who came from a tech startup that came out of a university, Northwestern, and that he was able to create a prospect for his future for that company in a challenging type of space and hopefully providing leadership to grow economic opportunities throughout Chicago, including in the south and west sides of the city. So thank you for joining us, Michael. Um, we appreciate your perspective and helping to connect Chicago and Champaign as one regional corridor. Thank you, Laura, and good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. And hopefully you all saw the great news that we finally can welcome fans back in the baseball uh, stadium starting uh, the, the season in April. And um, like you said, Laura, sometimes telling stories visually in an impactful manner matters very much for all of us. Uh, my name is Michael Fastnacht. I'm the first ever chief marketing officer for the city of Chicago and the interim CEO of World Business Chicago. Our board comprises of more than 70 C-suite leaders and executives who really represent the largest, most important innovative companies in Chicago and Illinois. First, I want to say thank you to the University of Illinois Research Park for the partnership with World Business Chicago to support this very important summit. I'm grateful for, to you, Laura, and your whole team for the invite, the opportunity to contribute to this great summit. I'm really proud to say that WBC works very closely with our colleagues at the University of Illinois in their thriving community of innovators, entrepreneurs, and startups. And next time when we host a sub in Champaign, I would encourage you to drive the quick two hours up to Chicago for a quick visit. We would love to welcome and host you in our great city. Secondly, I just want to share a few things about how Chicago and Illinois' vital role is playing and becoming stronger and stronger when it becomes our region's thriving food and ag ecosystem. Last April, Mayor Lightfoot convened an economic recovery task force where we published a strategic plan to ensure that we have an inclusive and equitable recovery post-pandemic. We were really the first city in the US to publish a comprehensive economic recovery plan that details our guidelines of how we're building an inclusive recovery. It focused not just about how do we solve some of our systemic economic inequalities, but also how we focus on a few key growth sectors, including food and agriculture. You can find this report on our website because I think it's a very important document of how we think long term. And clearly, this pandemic has accelerated innovation in our local food and ag innovation ecosystem. Some food startups are benefiting from a surge in online grocery shopping, at home cooking, and like Farmer's Fridge, many are involving their business model to meet the needs of this pandemic. New companies are starting almost every day to solve new complex problems and investors are betting big time on them. According to PitchBook, the number of funding deals in the Chicago area increased fourfold 
to almost 400 from less than 100 a few years back. I'm very proud to say the number of food and beverage companies headquartered in Chicago, Illinois has increased from less than 100 just two years ago to now to 373 headquartered here. An amazing success stories that we need to tell much more often. Today's panel will more about these recent trends and why we are such a great home to make Chicago the food innovation capital of the world. You'll hear from a good friend, Deputy Mayor Samir Maika, on how the, Chicago, how the city can play an active role as an accelerator for entrepreneurs and startups. And the Vice President and General Manager of Quaker Foods North America, Robert Wiedbrook, on why they are calling Chicago home. And from Linda malas Porsenheim, who will share more about her own personal journey experience how to build an innovative startup here right in Chicago. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's session, Dr. Vijay Singh, Director of the University of Illinois Integrated Biopressing Research Laboratory. Doctor, take it from here, please. Thank you, Michael, um, for your opening comments. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Vijay Singh and welcome to our Agri-Food Innovation Session. Um, I am a professor of food and bioprocess engineering and also the director of Integrated Bioprocessing Research Lab. And in this panel, we are going to talk about, as Michael mentioned, how Chicago continues to grow as a global hub for food and agri agriculture innovation and why it makes sense to scale up food and agri-tech startups right here in Illinois. So we have uh, three excellent panelists. As Michael mentioned, we have Linda Mallers Porzenheim, CEO and president of Farm Logics. We have Robert Reedbrook, senior vice president and general manager of Quaker Foods North America, and Samir Maker, deputy mayor of economic and neighborhood development for city of Chicago. So I will kick off the session with providing some background on integrated bioprocessing research lab and the food science pilot plan facility that we have here on our campus. Uh, but before I uh, do that, I'd like to thank Abin and Terrence of World Business Chicago for doing great job organizing the session and lining up excellent speakers. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, so what's IBRL? IBRL is a translational research facility it's a 40,000 square foot pilot plant space designed for scale up and to bring technologies closer to commercialization. We do a lot of industrial research here under technical testing agreements, but we also support academic research funded by major federal agencies such as National Science Foundation, US Department of Agriculture, Department of Energy, and in very near future, Department of Defense. Student learning, and continuing education is a very strong component of IBRL. We have some excellent capabilities in IBRL to process all kinds of agricultural materials, uh, doing separations, fractionation, conversion, product recovery, combined with our capabilities in food processing at Food Science Pilot Plant Facility uh, for beverages, dry ingredients, uh, canned foods, uh, brewing and distilling, and bakery. In the past two years, we have worked with almost 30 different companies. Many of them are repeat customers and conducted over 100 different uh, projects with small startups and multinationals. At the south part of our campus, this is the map of our south campus, we have an amazing industrial biotech innovation ecosystem. So here is IBRL. Across the street, we have the Food Science Pilot Plant Facility. And then a block north is where we have Institute for Genomic Biology, where we do high throughput microorganism development. And this is also one of the four BRCs, the CABI, which is housed at Institute for Genomic Biology. We have the greenhouses where we can grow new crops energy farm where we can do large scale field trials, produce large amounts of this produce that can be processed at IBRL and research park that provides a permanent base for these startups and other major companies. With that, we'll get started with our um, 
I'm going to stop sharing and we'll get started with our panel. And uh, first, what I'd like to do is have each panelist introduce themselves and their organization, and then we'll get started with uh, Q&A for the session. So first, I'll uh, invite Linda Matters to please introduce herself and her organization. Linda. Hello. Hello, and thanks for having me. Excited to be here. I'm Linda Mallers. I'm the CEO and founder of PharmLogics. Uh, we are a Chicago-born company. Um, I'm a Chicago-born person. Been here my whole life. Uh, but basically, um, I started the business out of my house, uh, then transitioned to 1871, uh, then to an office in my hometown of Evanston, and I have moved the office and myself downtown. So we are now downtown. We're a tech platform that automates corporate social responsibility initiatives through the design, management, and measurement of sustainable, local, and equitable supply chains in the food service space. So that's food moving into universities, healthcare systems, corporate cafeterias, and K-12 school districts. So we use a combination of machine learning and AI to create benchmarks, as well as identify opportunities for improvement. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Robert Reedbrook. Yes, good morning, VJ, and uh, thanks to all the attendants for joining. My name is Robert Rietbroek. I run the Quaker Oats Company in Chicago, or uh, Quaker Food North America. It's a sector uh, within PepsiCo um, that uh, runs a portfolio of food brands uh, for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacking. Um, and that's basically it. All right, thank you, Robert. Uh, Samir? Good morning. Thanks, Vijay. And uh, hello, everyone. I bring you greetings from Mayor Lightfoot. Uh, so my name is Samir Mayakar. I'm the Deputy Mayor for Neighborhood and Economic Development here in the great city of Chicago. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, I ran a deep tech company before this in a Chicago neighborhood. Um, and I'm really excited about uh, today's panel discussion because I chose to build my company in Chicago. We spun out of a national lab in a university um, and the city helped our company uh, be very successful. All right, excellent. So uh, the first question to all you, um, and a very common question, uh, Dean Kidwell asked that um, uh, earlier is how have you navigated the complexities of COVID-19 pandemic? So who wants to go first, Linda? Sure, okay. So, um, well, first of all, we uh, run the nation's largest search engine for sustainable, local, and equi equitably produced food products. Um, it represents $10 billion of food service spend across the country, and we ingest 100 million lines every single month. Um, so we were able to see in fine detail the decline of purchasing volume by schools and workplaces when they were closed and how that greatly impacted <clears throat> small business, including ours. I mean, we were servicing very large uh, broadline distributors who, you know, restaurants were closed. So a very tough time for the food service space. Um, the second feature of our, of our platform, though, is a marketplace that connects institutional buyers with producers of these products. And traditionally, we had been using the marketplace to connect local farms selling in a food service. But just prior to the pandemic, um, we had launched a new use of the marketplace for food hall management so that basically a cafeteria on a campus or in a workplace could be bringing in small business and support small local WBE, MBE and BIPOC owned businesses coming in as visiting vendors. So this would be restaurants, food trucks and other small food producers. And we realized quickly during the pandemic that this was going to drive off-premise sales. And a lot of studies that you read about the sustainability of restaurants today are about driving new markets and off-premise sales. And so this platform quickly became a recovery tool and it's had a lot of relevance even as schools and businesses are closed to allow cafeterias to pivot and support local businesses throughout the pandemic. Um, we lost a lot of business during the pandemic and uh, we took our PPP loan and used it to create a companion B2C app so that students and employees at workplaces can actually see the small uh, businesses that are visiting their workplaces and schools, order from them and either pick up on campus or at work or have it delivered to their home if they're working from home. And it was our first foray into the B2C space. It was a big pivot for us um, and it's been very exciting. Very nice. Thank you. Robert? Yeah, so it, it's no surprise that 2020 uh, was a challenging year for food manufacturers. Uh, Quaker has four manufacturing facilities in the United States, two right here in Illinois. 
with frontline workers who feed America. So putting their health and safety first has been our priority throughout the pandemic. We invested in uh, personal protective equipment and technology like remote video headsets, which allowed us to continue to keep our people safe, train new employees, but also keep the innovation on track. Um, we also focused on keeping store shelves uh, stocked so people could find the brands that they know and love. Um, but we had to reduce the number of items to get consumers more of the product they wanted through better and more line utilization. Uh, we added 10 production lines at our facilities in 2020. Um, and that included investment in our plant in Bridgeview, Illinois, with uh, increased capacity for our meals business. Um, and we donated more than 6 million meals to those most in need and committed um, half a million dollars to Feeding America to help families in need. So really being part of, part of the community and investing back into it. Thank you. Samir? Well, you know, working in city government, as you can imagine, uh, has been an extraordinary challenge over the past year. Um, cities have been placed under an immense amount of stress because of the pandemic. And so what Mayor Lightfoot tasked our team to do is to make sure that we handle the near term needs that have been caused by the day to day challenges of the pandemic, getting testing capacity in neighborhoods, making sure that we're efficiently and equitably distributing the vaccine, helping our small business community uh, recover. Um, so many of those day to day items <clears throat> have been a big focus here in City Hall. But what was also very important to the mayor, as Michael alluded to, is setting a long term trajectory for recovery. And so after publishing the first ever municipal economic recovery plan, uh, you know, Chicago is very focused on key sectors of growth coming out of the pandemic and uh, food and agriculture is squarely in those plans, uh, which is why I'm excited about today's conversation. Very nice. All right, next question. So what food and ag innovation trend or technology excites you the most? Linda? Well, um, I think the trend that excites me the most, and this happened as a result of the pandemic, is in the supply chain, particularly with distributors, we were always seeing this very hard line between hospitality, which is restaurants, and institutions, which are cafeterias, campuses, et cetera. Um, and we're seeing that line being blurred. I mean, just describe that food hall uh, environment um, that basically brings restaurants into institutions. But we're all, we also saw during the pandemic, restaurants operate as up markets um, where you could purchase other things. Um, prior to the pandemic, we saw this trend being embraced by Gen Z um, on college campuses, but now we're seeing it valued across the supply chain and being embraced by multiple generations, in, including this old baby boomer. So uh, the use of digital to fluidly bring these opportunities and to blur this line is really exciting as an entrepreneur because it means that there is room for a whole new generation of entrepreneurs to enter the space and to continue to support small business. Nice. Okay. Very nice. All right, Robert. And so, you know, at home consumption is on the rise and consumers have rediscovered our brands over the past year while families are back at the breakfast table. Um, we have a portfolio of breakfast, lunch, and dinner offerings, uh, and we aim to delight and provide consumers with delicious and nutrition solutions throughout the day. So this rebound of um, in-home consumption is now followed by a rebound of out-of-home consumption again, which is also great to see. But we're seeing a move to single-serve uh, products, such as cups and pouches, rather than bulk in, uh, in the industry. Now... Over the long run, you know, there's many trends. You know, of course, we've seen the rise of organic food, non-GMO food, uh, gluten-free, and various other uh, claims and trends. But the one that excites me a lot, Vijay, is uh, the trend uh, back to natural and clean label. And, and we've really embraced this with our Quaker branded portfolio um, and moved back to an all, in, all natural ingredients across the line, invested a lot of uh, money in, in our ingredients. Um, and now all our Quaker branded items contain no artificial flavors, uh, no preservatives or colors. That's the one that excites me. Yeah, very nice. Okay, Samir. Uh, well, I, you know, as a, as a former uh, entrepreneur, I'll say what excites me the most is that Chicago is the food innovation capital of the world. And a few weeks ago, I had a chance to visit a company uh, in our stockyards 
um, which was where a lot of meat used to be slaughtered. And it's actually a company innovating in the meat substitute industry. Um, it's a company called Nature's Find. And uh, Bill Gates and a number of other very prominent uh, people are investors in that company, along with some Chicago uh, uh, large corporates. What's exciting about Nature's Find is they have a micro-based meat substitute. And it's a really entrepreneurial story because they started in biofuels and then pivoted to making meat substitutes. And when you think about um, the carbon footprint of the, of the meat industry, um, this is a pretty significant shift away from that. And I'll tell you from the chicken nuggets to the breakfast patties and the other items I ate, um, they were delicious. I couldn't tell the difference. Uh, and, and I'm really excited about the future of Nature's Find here in Chicago, which is also where they manufacture all of their products. It's a great Chicago food innovation story. And I think they just closed a $100 million venture round. So we're certainly excited to see them growing here in the city. Very nice. Okay, the next one I have is why Illinois? Why Chicago? Why does your company choose to do business here in the state? Linda, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll start with okay. that. Oh, All right, sorry. okay. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm the, one of the chief salesmen <laughs> of the city and, and certainly of the, uh, of the state as well. What, you know, I personally chose to grow my company here and I think it's because of the ecosystem that we have, but when, when I think about the, the food and agriculture space, you know, Chicago's home to the largest food and beverage economy in the country. Um, it's over $7 billion. And so when you think of the ecosystem that you need to innovate and to grow, you're gonna have your customers here, you're gonna have your suppliers here, you're gonna have potential investors here and partners all across the value chain. You're also going to have access to all of the talent. When I think about the fact that the University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign is the number one uh, talent generator in food science and technology, this is truly ground zero of innovation um, in the state. And so you have a city that's investing deeply um, as part of our recovery efforts in this space. You have an entrepreneurial ecosystem and a lot of large corporates. So I, I think you know the, the better question is why would you not choose to grow uh, your company in this sector uh, if you're here. And the final thing I'll mention is when you think about distribution, and I know uh, Linda and Robert can comment on this, but Chicago is the largest intermodal hub in the Western hemisphere. And so when you think about the strategic importance of being close to your feedstock and close to your customers and distribution networks, um, you know, our geography is part of our key advantage. Yep. Very nice. Illinois brings some really powerful things in terms of feedstock availability, you know, intermodal transportation, water, energy. So it's a great place to have a base here in our state. All right, Linda. Yeah, so I completely echo everything that Samir said. Um, as far as Chicago, um, Chicago chose me. Um, my grandfather immigrated here in 1912. I've spent my whole life here. Um, but what I think is interesting is I began, began my tech career in the futures industry. So I've been involved in agricultural commodities for a while, uh, seasonality, price variability, all of that. And um, there is always been an agricultural entrepreneurial history that is embedded in Chicago history. I mean, I'm going back to the 1980s and I always felt that pulse and that pulse still exists. Um, our location makes it perfect. Um, the where we're situated, agreed as far as distribution. I have family uh, at the produce terminal. Um, it's an incredibly vibrant place to be. If you haven't visited, you must. Um, but also we're, we're right in the middle of the country. So it is so easy to get to our customers on either coast. I would not wanna be in New York business traveling to California and vice versa. Um, and I think for those that we hire, it's a great place to live as a young person. Obviously, we have a lot of engineers at our company, um, and we attract a lot of young people who love being by the water and, and basically the vibrancy of the city and the diversity and the food. And, um, but also having raised four kids here, it's a wonderful place to raise kids. Uh, it's a very diverse, culturally rich environment. 
um, with a wonderful public school system. Um, and ironically, I have two sons uh, who left college to launch a rap and hip hop video production company here who are wildly successful. And we're a better place to do that than Chicago. I have a daughter who is at the Art Institute and is getting a world-class education. There's just an entrepreneurial and creative energy here. Um, I've always associated with Chicago and it's really exciting to see uh, the next generation embrace it as well. Sure, very nice. Robert? And so Chicago has always been a good location for the food industry. Um, when we looked at uh, Fortune 500 headquarters, uh, our, our math said that there are more of those here in this city in the country than any other city. And there are about 2,000 food manufacturing companies located in Chicago. It's also a very good food innovation uh, location with incubators. I think we heard about 1871 earlier from Linda, but we also have the hatchery. And PepsiCo has supported the hatchery since 2018 with the goal of helping food industry entrepreneurs sustainably scale their businesses. So Chicago offers one of the most diverse, talented workforces in the United States. And careers in the food and beverage sector enable economic growth across our diverse neighborhoods here in the city. Um, the key um, you know, to the partnership between the city and the industry is really to prepare our community residents with training, immersion programs, and also support services to compete for jobs in the food and beverage sector. We have a partnership as PepsiCo with City Colleges of Chicago, which aims to uplift communities with scholarships for certificate programs in high demand fields uh, such as manufacturing, logistics, and transportation, and a scholarship program for students with two-year degrees who want to pursue their four-year degrees. You know, for us at PepsiCo, Chicago uh, is an anchor, and we are looking forward to a continued partnership with the city of Chicago, its communities, and its people uh, to continue to fuel a thriving and innovative workforce. Very nice. Okay, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions. There's a question for you, Robert, and I'm gonna read it out. Um, what functional ingredients are consumers looking for in oats? And what is Quaker Oats working on to improve the nutritional attributes of oats? Yeah, so the oat is uh, an ancient grain and has never been modified genetically. Um, it's inherently uh, gluten-free, and it's packed with um, nutrients such as protein and beta-glucan. Beta-glucan is an immune system booster, and obviously the whole world is looking for protein right now. It also has fiber, and it's very good for gut health, uh, heart health, and, um, you know, and generally it's, it's a very healthy grain that's, uh, that can be used for breakfast dishes. In some markets, it's used for dinner, actually. Um, and, uh, and people like to bake with oats as well. So it's a very versatile um, grain and uh, it's very popular and our business is uh, growing, uh, has been growing rapidly uh, over the last year. Okay, very nice. All right, let's see. Um, there's another one here. How can Chicago work better to cultivate relationships with other parts of the state to improve the innovation community in ag tech and agri-food? So Samir, you want to take a shot at that? Sure, you know, I think the what's really important to Chicago is, is the whole region and the state. I mean, ultimately uh, a rising tide lifts all the boats and, and truthfully the connection from uh, downstate, which is where you have uh, such tremendous competencies in uh, farming and in agriculture and certainly with institutions like the University of Illinois, um, it's very important that they're connected um, into the city as well and vice versa. Um, one of our ways to do that in an area we're uh, putting more investment in is the Discovery Partners Institute and the Illinois Innovation Network, which is tying together um, many of the University of Illinois uh, systems together with many of the other academic institutions and civic institutions uh, throughout the Chicagoland region. And so we're very encouraged that they will be building a hub here um, in the southern part of the loop in Chicago, and that will be bringing talent in um, from downstate uh, into the city and connecting people in, in the city with people downstate. Um, so I'm highly encouraged by the future of DPI and what that means to connect Chicago uh, with the rest of the state. Great, very nice. 
All right, I think I have a one last question. We talked about all these positives about you know growth and everything here in Chicago and Illinois. What do you think are some challenges that these startups that want to innovate in the space, agri and food face here in our state? I'll take it. Sure. Okay. All right. So, um, so I think one of the challenges, particularly if you're a small business or a startup is, um, and you're looking to get into the supply chain is how to do that successfully. Um, I just having been a small business getting into a large supply chain, um, it was a little bit of a shock. I remember uh, when we started our program at Aramark Chicago Public Schools, and Cisco said we needed G tins for our product, and I didn't know what that was, and they were so annoyed with me. Um, so there's there's the realities of getting into the supply chain, um, insurance, gap certification, food safety certification, all of that. Um, we do a lot of hand holding with small suppliers and coach them in how to be successful in getting into the supply chain. Um, the other part is around, um, you know, uh, how corporations can support as well, right? And I think that it really is a matter of aligning who you are with what your goals are, right? Because um, it is a long supply chain and what is considered just or equitable support is a subjective definition. Um, we have 5,000 dashboards we look across and everybody defines that differently. So a company needs to decide as well, who can they bring in and support realistically? Um, are they gonna do that with hiring? Are they gonna do that with sourcing? Um, where on the supply chain are they going to do that? And then make it clear uh, what is required from a compliance standpoint so that small business has that opportunity uh, to scale their business and sell to them. Thank you. Anything to add, Robert or Samir? The, the one thing I would mention, um, you know, having been an entrepreneur in the city as well, one of the areas we're deeply focused on is making sure that entrepreneurs have the access to capital they need to scale their business. And so we've done very well in the early stages of fundraising. Um, and it's, it's important that when companies are incubated um, uh, in great innovation centers like the one Laura runs, um, that, they can, that they can continue to grow in the state. When you start getting to a series B, C, D, E round of funding, um, that's where sometimes entrepreneurs turn to other parts of the country to raise their funds. Um, that, that trajectory in food and ag is starting to shift more locally when you see something like Nature's Fine when they raise that $100 million. So we want to make sure, uh, I, I think, that we get over that challenge and that after you raise your seed or Series A round, um, that that growth capital you need um, is something that uh, has more local participation here, uh, not only with the strategic investors in the, in the corporate sector, um, but with more venture funds here in Chicago. Very nice. Thank you. All right, well, any last words from our panelists? Hey, Vijay, um, you know, I just thought I'd say this, you know, PepsiCo is now the second largest food company in the world. Quaker is obviously a, a division of PepsiCo, but we also now have our second largest office in Chicago worldwide. Um, and Chicago has always been part of uh, Quaker's history. Uh, we, our presence in Chicago dates back to 1901. And we believe it's a great place to run a food company. Um, and also the four manufacturing sites are within driving distance. So we can actually drive to our manufacturing sites from the city. Um, and I wanted to uh, mention that we're moving into the uh, old post office. So that's been a completely renovated um, building. You wouldn't believe how beautiful it is. And we have about 1300 uh, Chicago employees that will move into 192,000 square foot floor in the redevelopment. And it's uh, truly a beautiful uh, state-of-the-art high-tech space. Uh, and we believe our business and organization can thrive in Chicago. Very nice. All right, our time is up. It's 10.15. I would like to thank you all, Linda, Samir, Robert, Michael. Uh, back to you, Laura. Well, thank you for all our panelists and thanks to Eben from Chicago Next for organizing all our guests. Vijay Singh is a distinguished professor at the University of Illinois, and he told you a little bit more about the Integrated Bioprocessing Research Lab, one of the capabilities that is making it possible to have alternative proteins and new food sources based from bioproducts. We are going to be